Today I'm going to conclude our session by speaking on applications of interoperative parathyroid hormone testing with regard to the treatment of patients with hyperparathyroidism. And I, I know probably most hospitals have access to rapid PTH testing, but not necessarily all. And I hope to make a case for you that it is worthwhile to have this technology available to you in the operating room. So just to give you a little of the basis of how this testing works and the rationale behind it, uh, parathyroid hormone uh, is secreted by parathyroid glands by the chief cells and has a very short half-life of approximately two to three minutes. Therefore, if you have a patient, um, like shown here, the thyroid and parathyroid shown here, if you have a patient with a single parathyroid adenoma, that adenoma is making 100% of the PTH and the other three glands are suppressed. Therefore, if you go in surgically and you remove the only source of parathyroid hormone, you should see a rapid drop in the PTH level in that patient because of the very short half-life of the hormone. So there are many types of PTH testing machines that are commercially available. This is the one we use at UAB. It's called the Beckman Unicell DXL 600, which sits in our core lab. And it's actually very uh, economical for the hospital to have this machine just because in addition to PTH testing, it performs all these different endocrine tests. So the hospital gets revenue for uh, doing all these tests, plus in addition to the rapid PTH. And so what most hospitals do is they have this sitting in their core lab and either you tube down your samples down or you have a runner down, um, and therefore it becomes very, very economically positive. So uh, how it works is that if you have a patient you're operating on for hyperparathyroidism and you send the, a PTH level before surgery, and we usually do that in the PACU, have it drawn, and then you go into surgery, you take out what you think is the only abnormal gland, and then you check the PTH level interoperatively at 5, 10, and we typically do it 5, 10, and 15 minutes. If that's the only bad gland, you should see a 50% drop at five minutes because the half-life is shorter than five minutes in the hormone level, which uh, should continue to drop. And if you see that, you're uh, with about 99.5% certainty that that's the only abnormal gland and you can stop your operation. But uh, in another context, if you have a patient for which you're taking the operating room who you think has just one abnormal gland, you, you get a PTH uh, level before surgery, you take out that single gland and you see a drop, but not quite a drop by 50% shown here at the white line. That keys you while you're in the operating room that there must be at least a second abnormal gland uh, that you can then find at the time of surgery, take out, and then if you take out that second abnormal gland and you check PTH again at five minutes after that and you see the drop, that tells you, okay, what you thought there was one gland, but for sure there are two abnormal glands, and now you've taken the second one out, the PTH dropped, so now you've cured this patient. So if you didn't have PTH, potentially you would have just removed that one gland and stopped and the patient wouldn't have been cured. So why utilize this technology? Well, I think you'll get better outcomes if you do, and there's data suggest if you use this technology that you will have a better cure rate uh, for parathyroid surgery. So actually, this is a study uh, we did at my former institution at the University of Wisconsin where we looked at patients um, because when I got there on the faculty, we did not have PTH testing. And uh, then we quickly implemented PTH testing with collaboration with the hospital. And so what we looked at in patients in group one who were having surgery at Wisconsin prior to PTH testing, the cure rate in that group was about 90%, but when we implemented PTH testing, that cure rate jumped up to almost 100%. And really that increase in cure rate was attributed to the implementation of PTH testing because again, we were identifying patients who had additional abnormal glands which the surgeon didn't recognize by imaging before surgery that we were detecting at the time of surgery. And this is how a, a patient, um, this is how it can affect a patient. And so this is a patient that was referred uh, to me with an elevated calcium, an elevated parathyroid hormone, osteoporosis. And actually, in this case, the SESTAMIBI B scan uh, suggested that the abnormal parathyroid gland was down in the mediastinum here in the chest. And typically, when I see a parathyroid gland in the mediastinum, 
I look at the distance between the thyroid and the heart, and if it's uh, more than halfway towards the heart, I know that's not accessible from the neck, and we're going to approach that through the chest. So uh, again, the Sestamibi scan shows a mediastinal parathyroid. So in this patient, uh, typically our approach would be to do it thoracoscopically in conjunction with our thoracic surgeons. And so you can see here is that patient that I showed who scan shows the uh, parathyroid in the left chest. We put them on a little lateral, lateral decubitus position. We'd enter through three uh, port sites in the left lateral chest, uh, shown here. Uh, we use a harmonic scalpel, and I do radio-guided surgery, so we use a laparoscopic radio-guided gamma probe, and we put that into the chest to help finally localize. And uh, this is just an example. If you're looking at, uh, this is the left chest, this is the left lung collapse, this is the mediastinum. And our, this is one of the first cases we did with our thoracic surgeons who said that I see the parathyroid here, but the parathyroid is really down here because the gamma probe showed us where it was. Here's just a use of that technology. We usually use a harmonic scalpel, take it out. And there's a parathyroid gland you can see, and it's usually in the thymus down in the chest. And there it is. So in this patient, so we took out that mediastinal parathyroid. You can see the baseline PTH is 168. We checked the PTH 5, 10, and 15 minutes later, and you can see the PTH is not falling. So although we have a verified parathyroid gland out, down here in the chest, the PTH uh, test tells us that there is another one there that was missed by imaging. So whenever I plan the mediastinal approach, I also consent the patient for a neck operation too. So in this case, we uh, uh, then flipped the patient over, prepped the neck, and uh, we opened it and we found a right upper parathyroid adenoma. We send the PTH and it falls by the 50%. So this patient now is cured, as opposed to if we had stopped the operation after the mediastinal, that patient would have not been cured, and we would have had to do a second operation to get that gland out. So PTH testing can help you um, improve your cure rate for this disease. It can also help you um, with identification of what is parathyroid tissue and what is not at the time of surgery. So sometimes when you're in the operating room, you're not sure, is that a parathyroid gland or not? How can I do to distinguish? And so often surgeons you will utilize a frozen section and send it off. And a lot of times pathologists have a hard time identifying what's parathyroid, what's thyroid um, from other tissues. So we came up with this idea, why not use the PTH assay to help you along here? And so we did a prospective study where we actually went to the operating room and we consented uh, 68 patients who were undergoing a surgery for uh, a whole bunch of head and neck problems, and we collected samples of their tissues, 223, uh, some parathyroid, thyroid, and adipose tissue. And then we actually uh, did a couple things with the tissue. We either took a small biopsy or did an FNA of that, and we plunged the uh, tissue into uh, a milliliter of saline and then we just ran a PTH test on it. And at that time, we were using uh, the Roche uh, instrument, but this will work with any PTH instrument. And so these are the results of all those uh, samples that we did, basically showing if you do a PTH test on parathyroid tissue, the levels are in the thousands, as shown here. If you do it on thyroid tissue, it's down here in the um, below, below 100, same with, with lymphatic tissue and adipose tissue. So this test can really tell you interoperatively whether or not a piece of tissue is parathyroid tissue or not by either just taking a small piece, plunging it in saline, and sending the saline off for a rapid PTH, or else doing an FNA on the lesion. So it really allows you to uh, make the distinction uh, very quickly whether or not a tissue is parathyroid or not. It can also help you find parathyroid glands. So this is a patient of mine, a 54-year-old woman who came from Rockland, Maine with severe fatigue, elevated calcium and PTH, as well as osteoporosis. And this is her Sestamibi scan, and you can see it's not really positive. She's got her right thyroid gland is enlarged here, um, but there's no sign of any uh, parathyroid gland, and even on the delayed imaging, so uh, it was read as negative. But we still took her to the operating room, 
And what we did is uh, we started on the left side and looked at her upper parathyroid gland and it looked totally normal. I couldn't find the um, left lower parathyroid gland, so I went to the right side and I saw a normal parathyroid gland there and I saw a 200 milligram adenoma on the right side, so I took that out. Now, of course, I sent PTH and you can see that the starting PTH is 105, but the PTH again does not fall. So this tells me I'm missing a parathyroid gland somewhere. And this is a classic board question too for our trainees in the room. So um, what do I do? Well, that is out. And so my next step is I'm gonna do a cervical thymectomy. I'm gonna clear all the fat and lymph nodes on the lower part of the left uh, uh, neck there, uh, hoping that the missing parathyroid is in the thymus. I check PTH uh, after I've cleared all this tissue, and you can see the PTH five and 10 minutes after clearing all that tissue, again, does not fall, telling me I don't have that gland. So I open the carotid sheath and I explore, nothing. So then uh, my next step here is uh, the use of PTH. So I take a syringe with a 23 gauge needle and I draw PTH levels from the IJs as low in the neck as I can go on the right. And I draw it on the left and I send those for PTH. And you can see on the right side, the PTH comes back 109 from this IJ. On the left, it's 957. So that tells me that this PTA, this missing parathyroid has to be draining into the IJ at some place above where I've stuck the needle. So then I extend my incision to go way up high, and here I find the 400 milligram undescended parathyroid gland that uh, requires me to revise my incision to go up high. And before I do that, um, making an incision bigger and going a different direction, having the knowledge that the PTH tells me that there is something definitely up there uh, allows me to do that. And so we, we find that high gland, we resect it, and the PTH, you can see, falls at, uh, at 10 and 15 minutes down to the normal range. And this is just the pathology on the initial um, upper parathyroid and the undescended uh, one in the left neck. And um, when you're doing a reoperative surgery for parathyroid uh, operations, it can also uh, provide you some real-time guidance. And so this is another patient was referred to me, a 50-year-old gentleman with uh, high calcium and PTH. He had had two previous parathyroidectomies. And then we tried to find where his uh, missing gland was. So we did a Cestamibi scan, a subtraction scan, an ultrasound, a CT, MRI, and PET. All of them are negative. So what we decided to do is do venous sampling, um, and we got our interventional radiologist to do this, but we used the PTH assay to provide real-time guidance. So what we did is, so they uh, entered the, the groin into the IVC, it drew a level of PTH, uh, which was elevated in 97, uh, then threaded a catheter up high, uh, and it's 193, so we're getting close to where the source is. Uh, they shoot a venogram to help guide um, and then start uh, threading the catheter up along the various venous anatomy and they go out to the right side and the PTH is still elevated um, but not super high. They go up high on the right IJ, it drops a little. And the nice thing about this is they're sending these levels in real time so they're uh, getting these back as they, the patient is on the table. So you can see as they send samples from these various areas, you can see it gets a little higher down here at the bottom, and all of a sudden there's one value right here at the base that is the highest of all the sampling. And because they have this real time, they can then try to cannulate something that's near that highest level. And here they shoot a venogram and they see there's some drainage going up there. And then they thread a catheter up high and they can see, well, up high it's 120, 130, and no, there is 1,000. So that tells us that there's an abnormal parathyroid gland somewhere here that's draining into this vein uh, below this, but above this. And you can see it slowly drops off, and so that led to the successful identification of where this gland was. And again, it was negative on imaging, but we knew exactly where it was from the venous sampling. So I hope that I've made a case to you that PTH testing can really add value in uh, your management of uh, patients with hyperparathyroidism interoperatively because it, it can make your results better. 
and really the, uh, the reason I use it is it can really change your management in uh, certain cases. Thanks so much for your attention.